I'm here today with Keith, who is the co-founder of ODOG. Thank you so much, Keith, for joining us today from Sri Lanka. Hi, Belinda. Great to be here. Pleasure. Can you please tell us more about ODOG? So ODOG is a telemedicine virtual care business. We essentially connect um, people and businesses to doctors over the internet and over an app. Thank you. What's the story behind your company? My fellow co-founder had a child, uh, his second child about four years ago. Um, anyone with children knows they're in and out of the hospital all the time. And whilst waiting for a doctor in a surgery in Sri Lanka, he read an article on how telemedicine will change the landscape for healthcare forever. And by the end of that uh, visit to a doctor, he decided to leave the corporate world um, and start up ODOC, uh, Sri Lanka's first telemedicine business. What happened in Sri Lanka after COVID-19 spread across the world? Sri Lanka took quite an aggressive approach um, when the first community transmission hit in March. They essentially locked the country down, forced lockdown by a curfew, so people weren't able to even leave their homes. And that lasted for nearly two months. Um, uh, and then they, they also, in parallel, closed the borders, both incoming and outgoing. Um, so there was no kind of incoming um, COVID. Um, and they spent some time controlling via the curfews uh, COVID within the country. Can you please talk us through the timeline of all dogs pivot after COVID-19 spread across the world? Yeah, I mean, as soon as COVID hit, we made the strategic decision um, based on demand from our B2C, from our consumer side of the business. Almost overnight, we went from a 99% B2B business to a 50% B2C business. So we pivoted both our product, our tech, our marketing and distribution strategy to focus on the mass market and consumers. Can you please tell us more about ODOC's growth? We've, I would say we've grown exponentially since COVID. Um, just to give you some ideas of numbers, revenue at, at our peak, um, I think we seven and a half X, nearly eight X due to the pandemic. Number of consults and tractions, uh, 10x um, through through the heart through the heart of the um, pandemic, and the number of doctors that were added to our platform went from 500 to 750 um, almost overnight. Um, and registrations and app installs, you know, at the peak we got 2,000 um, installs a week, um, which in a Sri Lankan context um, we went from kind of 30, 40 installs um, a week to thousands of installs a week, um, exponential growth. So um, for every one of our core metrics um, was close to double digiting, actually, um, growth wise. Tell us more about the challenges that you faced and how you were able to solve them. Yeah, I mean, probably the biggest challenge we had was meeting the demand, actually, um, with more consultations, adding more doctors, that meant more onboarding, training, um, our core op, I think, began to creak just with the pure demand that we had technology challenges, both architecturally, but, you know, we were, we were and we still are a young business um, and our tech hadn't really been battle tested for volume. So the early signs of that kind of overnight growth um, caused some real challenges on our core operation and technology, which we were forced to invest in and address almost overnight. I think within a month, um, we got a good handle on making sure the op was smooth and the technology was smooth, but also a real focus on patient experience, seeing more volume. Um, we don't just see ourselves as kind of just doing a consultation and forgetting about the patient. Everything about the interaction with our business is central around kind of patient-centric care. Um, before you speak to us, the booking experience, the CX, the front end of it, but also the post consultation experience, you know, MPS, understanding what was good, you know, following up with the patients, with the doctors directly. Um, and those challenges were really kind of borne out through COVID that we, we didn't really have a smooth kind of end to end experience. I think through that, probably that three months through March onwards, um, forced us to do that. Can you please tell us more about how you work with the government? Yeah, so we, we tied up with the government in the early days of COVID. We essentially run the government's telemedicine line. What that means is uh, anyone within the country can consult with a government doctor for free at any time using the ODOC app. So essentially we are one of the main partners for telemedicine uh, for the public sector, for the Ministry of Health.
what issues are governments facing when it comes to offering tech solutions to the public? I think adoption of you know government sponsored technology is yeah, and platforms is the biggest challenge. We work in markets in South Asia where smartphone smartphone penetration is still low, literacy rates in some of our neighbouring countries are still low. So it's not just a question of rolling out technology, it's also educating the consumers. So when a government launches a technology platform, typically in these markets, there has to be a huge amount of sort of ATL, sort of local education, both in kind of traditional kind of um, press uh, and mediums um, to educate um, the mass market on how you use technology and how particularly you use these new platforms. How do you ensure data safety? Yeah, so, so you know, patient data, you know, health records, um, we take a very, very kind of conser you know, conservative view as, as far as kind of, you know, there's no local regulations um, or legislation that governs Sri Lanka. Policy is probably coming from the conversations that we've had with the government, but we hold ourselves to very high standards. So we basically use GDPR from, the, from Europe as the benchmark around um, sort of uh, patient security, um, data privacy. So we hold ourselves accountable to, to kind of baseline foreign standards. Um, and that thing makes things kind of very robust in, um, in Sri Lanka, but also future proofs us for moving across borders to some of our neighbours, but probably beyond kind of South Asia into Southeast Asia. Um, we try to, uh, or we do adopt um, sort of uh, frameworks like HIPAA to make sure our data is compliant. Um, to HIPAA standards, and that technology is also HIPAA, um, uh, is to a HIPAA co um, compliance standard as well. So, sort of the, the underlying frameworks of the technology um, have health data and, and data privacy at mind, but our overarching governance uh, around security and data privacy um, are, are lifted and shifted from European legislation. Compared to the rest of the world, do you think that Asia is a pioneer when it comes to technology? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, I, I think. Yeah, if, if I'm honest, I think, you know, we can almost separate Asia into different segments. You've got, you know, the innovation that's coming out of China and Japan being, you know, global economy, you know, two and three in the world behind the states and a huge innovation coming out of Southeast Asia. Um, and I think India is, you know, probably the next rising, not just economy, but actually kind of tech hub. I think with a Sri Lanka lens, um, I think we, we still have a long way to go as far as kind of being really the bleeding edge of innovation. Um, but that's one of the real challenges for, for running and being in a startup here, that we want to be innovating. Um, we have great talent in the country. We have great appetite. Um, interestingly, you know, for you know, investors are now looking at our, our markets. Uh, I think the addressable populations here, you know, we talk about big numbers in, in places like you know, a billion people in India, to you know, 400 million, you know, half a billion people across Bangladesh um, uh, and Pakistan. Um, so the real opportunity on the people side, I think, is in South Asia. Um, but I do think we have some way to go to really be on the bleeding edge of innovation. But we're a lot way for, a, a long way forward than where we were even like two or three years ago. I mean. You know, there's been some great startups here, some great innovative solutions that have been deployed and scaling at pace um, from places like Sri Lanka. What are Asia's strengths when it comes to innovation? So I would say kind of our, our, probably our key strength, and again, I'll answer this from a South Asian context, is some of the talent that we have in places like Sri Lanka and India. We've definitely seen trends over the last probably two or three years, but certainly expedited by COVID around repatriation of like the very top tier talent. So we saw probably over the last 10, 15 years, the very brightest talents and minds of Sri Lanka and India kind of qualify from the best engineering faculties and schools and go to the valley um, and go into you know, companies like Facebook, like Google. Um, and you see those people interspread across some of the very big tech giants across the world. I think what we've seen and certainly what we've seen at ODOC is some of that talent be repatriation. So whether that's a case that COVID has opened people's minds and you know people have wanted to change lifestyles as a as a as a result of COVID, or whether that's just been a natural cycle of you know there's been several big exits, and I think people, you know, always you know the top talent always went away with a view one day to come back and grow their own businesses. Um, so one, the number of that that top tier talent has come back, um, 
but two, we really are getting some some b- super bright kind of kids come out of the top engineering schools. Um, I've been working in Sri Lanka and Asia and South Asia particularly for the last nearly eight years personally, um, uh, and and I I did that for a reason. All my tech teams are now based out of out of these regions, um, and I really think the talent here is amazing and a real testament to the to the region and, and to the country. So I, I would answer that as. 100% the talent in the region. I think that this pandemic accelerated innovation within the health tech industry. Yeah, with, without doubt, I think probably across the industry, um, everyone's had to innovate. Um, there's been less footfall into hospitals. There's been a shift to virtual care across the world. Um, and I think COVID has preponed both innovation, um, but also changes to traditional healthcare business models forever. How do you see the future for ODOC in the next two years? So we are currently looking at growing our consumer bases in the markets we operate in. So Sri Lanka, the Maldives, we're looking at market entry um, into Cambodia um, and probably a few other analogous markets from there. Um, In two years, we really see we're the right product for the right time. during COVID, but also in a post-COVID world, to ride that wave and really go aggressively cross borders and and through the region. What is the new normal for the health tech industry? Yeah, the new normal. So that's a a great question. Um, You know, even with COVID, if it it disappears, um, and that's a big if, I think, you know, health health tech will, will, will be changed forever. People won't want to visit health facilities. Behaviors have changed. Um, I think I think everyone will be looking at you know models like ODOC, like virtual care. I think the um, uh, the, the bump in telemedicine has been felt all across the world. Um, I do feel that you know, although you know at ODOC we saw five, ten x exponential growth, it will level off and it has leveled off. So we're seeing kind of um, the back end of the bump, but we're still seeing you know three x where where we were before COVID, even after the bump. And I think that's shared across kind of, you know, traditional bricks and mortar uh, facilities that do virtual care, but all the virtual care providers. So for us, it's a great opportunity to leverage the behavioral change. Um, But I think the legacy of COVID will be, you know, how you adopt your business models, your technology, your operation, really with a very different mindset. Um, And of course, the other side of that is if COVID, if it takes, you know, four or five years for a vaccine to be found and distributed in some of these kind of emerging and frontier markets, which in my opinion, even if a vaccine is found next year, and, and you know, you know, you could question whether it will be as early as that, um, it will take years to be distributed last mile into places like Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka. Um, so, you know, these changes are here to stay. Um, and I think it will continually innovate. So, um, so yeah, it'll, it'll be an interesting couple of years. Um, and I think we are just seeing um, the start of this kind of new normal now. What are your predictions for the health tech industry post COVID-19? So I think they will be huge innovations in areas like AI, like robotics, like virtual um, diagnose, diagnostics, and obviously virtual care where we where we operate in. Um, I think a huge amount of capital will be deployed across health tech, but I think those are the areas that will really have to innovate um, post COVID. Do you think that this pandemic had also an impact on how we will use technology in the future? Yep, without doubt, I think you know, huge decentralization of people. People are living in different, you know, out of the core cities. Um, and I think the you know, adaptation of technology to work from home, to collaborate, probably there's been more behavioral change in the last six months than there had been in the last you know, four or five years. And that's not just from data savvy people, that's mass market as well general consumers would ha- have had to adopt new technology to live their lives and, and both personal lives and, and professional lives.